sir uh, now i invite dr raju sampangi sir uh, for his talk and uh, may I request dr jitendra fogat sir to introduce dr raju hello everybody uh, dr uh, raju sampangi has completed his uh, ms uh, from aims and also in uh, vitorina agency training from rp center aims he is a innovator at heart and developed a new universal attachment for payment lens for retinal wide angle viewing system also he has recently developed a new adapter for 3d recording he is a renowned vitorina surgeon and now practicing in bangalore thank you sir mm. Yeah, thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction. At the outset, I would like to thank uh, the Ophthalmic Society of uh, Karnal Eye Surgeons uh, at Karnal and uh, Dr. Kanduja in uh, particular for giving me opportunity. It was a treat to listen to all the talks before Dr. Rohan, my teacher, and Dr. Rajesh uh, gave very excellent talks. Uh, apart from Dr. Rajiv Raman and Aditya. Uh, all the uh, retina specific talks my talk is going to be on something that will be very useful for all the general ophthalmologists who are the first contact for all trauma cases and all this collection of cases that i'm going to show you are real and they have happened to us and these were the mistakes that we have noted down and it's better that we all understand what mistakes can happen and how we can prevent them in future especially in trauma because these cases are uh, most likely end up as medical legal cases so when can mistakes happen uh, in uh, uh, trauma cases actually it can happen at the time of history taking at the time of examination uh, the management of these cases the follow up and more importantly the documentation of these cases so let me try and explain to you with some case scenarios this is the first patient a young girl a four and a half year old girl came with injury to the eye and she was found to have a small red spot and she was brought to the hospital within one hour of trauma to the opd for checkup and on examination there was a very small subconjunctival hemorrhage and a, probably a small self sealed penetrating uh, injury uh, about 4 mm from the limbus the child had a vision of 6 by 6 the patient was treated with topical medication the patient parents were very anxious they were reassured that it's a small wound it will heal and nothing to worry the child was actually called for follow up after one week now do you feel there are any gaps in the management of this case do you expect yourself to be dragged to the court in this case in future do you take this case lightly or seriously and what do you tell regarding the vision what do you prognosticate to the patients regarding the vision in future actually this child unfortunately developed end of thermitis on the third day and the history when we they took a detailed history it turned out that they were playing bow and arrow and the arrow was with a broomstick while playing so the whole situation now changed just because the injury was with a broomstick so what you learn from this case case is a thorough history is important always try to get a mental picture of the injury recreate the scene of the injury and corroborate it with the findings of examination if there is a mismatch between the history given and the findings a warning bell should ring in your minds that this case is a potentially medical legal case at a later point of time your findings should corroborate with the history if it is not then there is something amiss especially if a broomstick is injured always keep in more mind that a very close watch is required in these cases as this can end up with infection and if you you need to intervene very early as for that you need to call this patients uh, quite often this patient number 2 a 60 year old man who came with injury uh, following a fall from the bike the patient presented immediately after the injury the vision was 6 by 6 patient had a mild concussion injury on the forehead as you can see here what next would you do the patient was given topical medication and was asked to come after 2 weeks for sos after 4 days of using the drops the patient came back with this kind of a picture now what do you do now still the vision is 6 by 6 anterior segment and posterior segment are normal in this case 
So would you continue the same treatment? Would you give anti-inflammatory medications? Would you investigate further? Actually, this is raccoon eyes. This is a sign of underlying trauma, and most of the times it can be an indicator of basal skull fracture or fracture of the facial bones. So this requires an urgent CT scan and a neurosurgery consultation. The case number three is a patient who presented to me 12, week, 12 months after an injury, and he was coming for a second opinion. The patient was traveling on a bike and was hit by a vehicle that was coming from the wrong side, and he fell down. The patient was not wearing a helmet at that time and fell on the pavement and hit on the left side forehead. There was no loss of consciousness. He had bruises and a fracture of his tibia. He was treated in a government hospital where his fracture of tibia was treated. And at that time, an ophthalmic consultation was also sought. The patient was noted to have periorbital edema and subconjunctival hemorrhage. And bedside vision was noted as equal in both the eyes. And the patient did not complain of visual problems at that point of time. Pandas was reported as normal. Patient was asked to review in OPD after three weeks. However, 12 months later, the situation was something different. The patient had filed a case against the person who was involved in the accident. The patient sent for second opinion as per the request of the opposite lawyer. The vision in the left eye was actually PL positive, and the lawyer was alleging that the vision loss was due to medical mismanagement. The patient had a traumatic optic neuropathy. Now, what you learn from these two cases is any injury in the region of the bro or a forehead can cause fractures. And the fractures can involve the optic canal. It's always important that we order a CT scan and very specifically write for cuts of the optic canal to rule out any bony fragments in the optic canal. Because if it is found, at least we can Treat these patients by a surgery, uh, decompression surgery can be done in these patients. So it's very important in these patients, whenever they have a trauma in the region of the bro, that the risk of traumatic optic neuropathy should be explained to these patients. Case number four, uh, this was seen in a hospital where I'm a visiting consultant for retina. A 26-year-old male patient presented with something hitting the eye and falling off while he was standing in a workshop. He presented within two hours. Patient was seen at 6.30 p.m. in the OPD. It was the closing time. At that time, again, the vision was 6 by 6. Patient had a subconjunctival hemorrhage nasally. The antechamber was clear. The patient was actually given topical antibiotics and cycloplegics and was asked to come the next day for a fundus examination. Now, what this patient did was, because his vision was normal and he was comfortable, he did not come back for the eye examination. One month later, however, he came back with a finding, like uh, the, with a complaint that his vision had dropped in his uh, injured eye. And when we saw him, he had an inferior retinal detachment and a suspected intraocular foreign body. When the information about the RD was given and a possible intraocular foreign body was given to the patient, the patient started accusing that no follow up was advised. Luckily, however, we had clearly documented in his file that a dilated fundus examination has to be done the next day. And this documentation helped us to make the patient realize that it was his mistake of not following up. So it is very important in these cases that you should uh, uh, make sure you write it in bold and stress the same to the patient that he requires a fundus examination and also get the patient to sign it. This is what the corrective uh, action that we took after uh, this patient accused us of uh, not uh, telling us or stressing the need for follow-up. So always try to get a signature of the patient or the attender along with their names and the phone numbers. This patient number five who presented uh, uh, with a history of uh, trauma about six months back, the patient had a self-sealed uh, corneal wound and cataract. The patient was advised uh, cataract surgery uh, but he came to us for, to get, uh, for getting operated. Now, what do you do? You jump in and uh, proceed and operate uh, on this patient for cataract surgery? Obviously, no. We'll do a B scan. We did a B scan. It was anechoic and no foreign body was seen. Now, let us see what happened during the surgery. The steps of the surgery were routine. We did the CCC. 
and the started with the FACO. When we are doing the FACO, there you could see the foreign body. It was an intralenticular foreign body. The foreign body had lodged inside the lens and uh, we removed it and the IOL was implanted. Now, actually, in this case, actually, I had seen this patient pre-op and I had done the basic. Know the exact location of the foreign body. And in this case, so we took an informed consent that there is a ventricular foreign body. And in case it drops down to the posterior segment, we may have to do a retinal surgery. This was told to the patient. So this kind of preparation helps us uh, in handling these cases better. Now coming to case number six, a patient coming to us four months later and he was coming for a second opinion. And when our patient comes for a second opinion, um, make sure that you document each and everything correctly. And this was a 16 year old boy who came with history of injury at workplace and something hitting the eye while hammering. He had shown to a nearby ophthalmologist, the uh, patient had a penetrating injury to the cornea with foreign body stuck in the wound. There was also injury to the iris and the lens. The foreign body which was there stuck was removed and primary wound repair was done. The patient was explained that a cataract removal will be done at a later point of time. However, it was postponed repeatedly because there was an intra- opinion four months after the incident. Now, when he came to me for my consultation, he was accompanied by father and also by the company manager. It's also important when somebody comes to you, especially with the history of trauma, a factory where it happened in a factory, always look at who are all accompanying the patient because you will get a hint about the medical legal aspects of this case. Now, I was going about asking about the history of uh, the trauma, the nature of the trauma, uh, were there any surgical records? And I also casually asked him, was there any X-ray or a CT scan done? And the reply was given by the manager. He gave me the, all the OPD details of the consultation. And he also started in an accusing way or a combative way that other doctor never asked for an X-ray or a CT scan. So when we saw him, this picture was something like this. He had a repaired corneal wound and you can see a partially absorbed uh, cataract. This is how bad the eye was. What next? Would you do a B-scan? We did a B-scan, it was normal. Now, would you go ahead and operate this case? I got a CT scan done in this patient, and there it goes. The patient had one more foreign body, it had broken down, and the other foreign body was in the uh, intraocular foreign body. Now, this patient was actually managed by an ophthalmologist whom I knew discount, had explained to the patient about the guarded prognosis. However, CT scan and X-ray was not done keeping in mind the economic status. The patient, parents were however instigated by somebody to file a case against the company because he was a 16-year-old kid and they, somebody instigated him to file a case for workplace injury. The company management had to pay for the compensation now. Now the blame game of mismanagement by the doctor started. Now, we explained the very guarded prognosis and we also asked for an ERG just to document the case further. Now, what happened in this case was after the CT scan came positive for a foreign body, a group of people from both the patient side and the company side landed up at the first doctor and created trouble and said that he had mismanaged the case. The doctor had to buy peace by giving money for further management, which was 10 times more than what he had initially taken for treating this patient. All this happened because of lack of proper documentation, no proper consent was taken, and there was incomplete investigation. So it's very important in a setting of trauma, a new suspected foreign body, make sure you document properly, have a very clear communication, have a very low threshold for ordering a CT scan, and always order a CT scan with one millimeter cuts to rule out an intraocular foreign body. If the patient is not willing to get a CT scan done, you can document it, write it down in the file. The patient doesn't want to get a CT scan and get a signature done. At least your job is done. 
Next, coming to uh, the last few cases, is a patient who came with uh, a history of injury with a tennis ball uh, one week after the injury, and this patient was diagnosed as Berlin sedima. Second opinion was taken as vision did not improve one week uh, after treatment and with oral steroids and topical uh, steroids uh, combination was given and the vision had not improved in this patient. Uh, the vision was uh, at the time of injury when it was seen first day, it was counting finger close to face and at one week also it was seen. Now when we got the OCT done, this is how the OCT looked like and this patient had a sub-retinal bleed, a sub-photoreceptor bleed. Now, most of these patients who have a sub-photoreceptor bleed or a sub-retinal bleed are sometimes misdiagnosed as Berlin's edema and treated conservatively. So, this is a take-home message. So, whenever you suspect that there could be a Berlin's edema, always get an OCT done just to rule out a, a sub-retinal hemorrhage. And in this case, the patient was treated with SF6 injection and you could see here the hemorrhage getting displaced and the patient vision improved. This is on a Oh, this is another patient who came to me at the same time. He also had a history of injury with uh, a tennis ball. And this is how his uh, retina looked like. He also had a subretinal elevation. And this elevation was actually sub-RP. It was below the RP. And this was also a subretinal hemorrhage. In this case, we didn't treat. And uh, uh, actively with a gas or uh, any other uh, intervention, we just observed this patient and over a serial follow-up, this patient improved from counting finger one meter to six by nine. So that, that's because this hemorrhage was sub-RP. And we, this was the first uh, publication in literature, world literature, that we used a SD OC to differentiate the traumatic submacular hemorrhage uh, using automatic 3D segmentation analysis. And the take home message in these two cases is if it is sub photoreceptors, then we need to do a pneumatic displacement. If it is sub RPE, then we can just observe these patients. So, in a setting of blunt trauma, always think beyond Berlin sedima and keep in mind a submacular hemorrhage. So, other things that we also need to do is to do a good peripheral IDO to rule out a retinal breaks and dialysis a gonioscopy to rule out angle recession glaucoma, especially if it is a blunt trauma. And we should also document in these patients that regular IOP measurements and IDO examinations are required. This has to be documented in these patients. So take home message is documentation is important. A good history taking is paramount. Understand the circumstances of the trauma and always try to correlate your findings. Patients may give false history initially, especially in assault cases, and then later come back when instigated by others to file cases. And then they'll want to certify the injury as severe. Knowing a good history will also help us guide our examination, investigation, and where we prognosticate these cases. When in doubt, always investigate. Not only to prove something positive, but also to rule out something sinister. Potentially, every case can be a medical legal in a setting of trauma. This has to be kept in mind. So every ophthalmologist has to be familiar with the loss in effect. A thorough documentation is very important to save ourselves in future. Investigate, be updated with the latest in management, and refer appropriately if required. These are the take-home messages that I would like to give. I would like to thank again uh, uh, all of you for giving me this opportunity uh, of sharing my experience in ocular trauma management. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for your intellectual presentation, sir, and your teaching.